It's nice to be back in Washington. Uh, we've been watching the winter on television in sunny La Jolla, and uh, <laughs> it's nice to get here and experience firsthand. It's not so bad. Uh, anyway, I'm going to talk to you about biological teleportation. And all of you have grown up in the uh, digital world, and what we're finding now is the digital world and biological worlds are becoming interchangeable to the extent that we can digitize biological information, send it through the internet or even as an electromagnetic wave, and then reconstruct it uh, at the other end. Uh, first, let me say something about uh, my institute. Uh, uh, this picture is our uh, brand new building we opened on the UC San Diego campus. It's the first carbon neutral research building in the world. So uh, not only do we uh, do fundamental research uh, in the biological and digital worlds, uh, we try to live uh, and practice things the way uh, we would like other people to. And so uh, the roof of this building is a half a megawatt power plant, uh, new construction uh, including uh, reducing the CO2 from uh, uh, the cement that goes into the building. So this is totally carbon neutral uh, and generates all its own power and recycles uh, the water. So this converting biological information to digital information uh, can be done at several levels, but when we read the genetic code, we're converting the four letter system in our DNA to the ones and zeros of the computer. This has been happening for quite a while. Uh, the first gene uh, was sequenced in the 1970s. Uh, the first DNA virus was sequenced in 1977. But it wasn't until 1995 uh, that we were able to sequence the first complete genetic code uh, of an organism. This used the STEM technologies. We had new mathematical algorithms, new technology, uh, new engineering, and new science to enable this. And this then changed things uh, five years later at a far greater scale uh, to do to the first version of the human genome. Uh, a few years after that, we're able to do the first complete diploid genome. Each of us have uh, two uh, fundamental genomes, the one that we get from our mother and the one that we get from our father. And the mathematics of separating that uh, in the computer uh, is a real challenge. Uh, we did it a number of ways uh, by sequencing the genome now uh, from individual cells. We're now in the process of scaling this up in San Diego to do 100,000 human genomes a year of trying to make it be part of everyday uh, medicine. So while the databases have been filling up with this digital biological information, the challenge becomes in part to go the other way. In fact, to also prove that what we're building in the computer databases represents real life and is both the information uh, that's necessary and sufficient to drive all DNA-based life forms. So we started with a project with taking the digital code in the computer and trying to reconstruct uh, the genetic code uh, chemically. And as soon as we started this process, there were all kinds of questions we were trying to answer. Does DNA contain all the necessary information uh, for cellular life? Uh, what's the smallest number of genes? Can we get down to a basic operating system uh, uh, for a, a living uh, cell? And as soon as we decided to go in the direction of trying to synthesize a DNA to boot it up into cells, it wasn't clear whether the chemistry would even allow remaking entire chromosomes. It had never been uh, done before. And even if we could, could we find a way to boot it up in a cell, or would we just have a large piece of uh, chemical DNA? We decided to start with a smaller project. We started with uh, a uh, bacteriophage Phi X174. This was the first uh, DNA phage uh, sequenced by Sanger and his group in 1977. And we decided to start with it because it had historical significance, but also because it was shown that you could not vary the genetic code at all and still get a viable uh, virus. The machines that write and print the genetic code uh, are not very accurate. Uh, each 
time you make pieces that are slightly longer, uh, you introduce more errors. So we had to develop new ways to correct the errors uh, in the sequence. And then we started with this digital code. We designed small pieces, found ways to put them together to correct the errors. And two weeks later, we had made the entire 5,000 uh, plus uh, base pair uh, chromosome. And the next stage was to insert that into a E. coli bacterial cell. And what happened was quite dramatic. As soon as we put the synthetic chemically made DNA in the cell, the cell started reading it just like loading a new piece of software uh, in your computer. It started making the proteins that were coded for in that genome. The protein self-assembled to form the virus. The virus particles accumulated uh, until they burst the cell open and then went on to infect other cells. And that's how we detect it. You see these clear spots, that's a bacterial lawn, and every place you see these clear spots is where the virus uh, killed the bacterial cells. We call this a situation where the software is building its own hardware. All we did was put in a piece of chemical software in the cell, and we ended up with these viral particles that can infect other cells and make more copies of themselves. Now, our goal wasn't to build viruses. We wanted to build entire self-replicating uh, biological cells. But we figured if we could make uh, small pieces accurately, uh, we could make a whole lot of those and then try and find a way to put them together uh, to create the entire bacterial chromosome. So we started uh, by designing uh, cassettes, 101 cassettes, uh, roughly the size of the phi X uh, phage. So it looks a little bit like a Final Four uh, playoff. Uh, we started with these uh, five to 7,000 base pair pieces. We put four of them together to get pieces that were now 24,000 letters long. And at each stage, we had to clone these in E. coli, grow them up, sequence them, make sure we weren't introducing errors in the process. And then we would take these in the next step, uh, putting uh, uh, three of these to get together to make 72,000 base pair pieces. Again, repeating the entire process, growing up, making a lot of DNA, sequencing it, checking it for accuracy, and going on to the next stage. The problem was when we got uh, these quarter genome molecules of over 100,000 base pairs, E. coli didn't like all this foreign DNA. So we had to look around uh, for a new system, and we found that brewer's yeast, uh, used for making wine, bread, and beer, has remarkable capacity to take up large pieces of DNA and keep them stably growing. But also there's a process called homologous recombination, where if pieces line up, uh, with the same sequence or the reciprocal sequence, uh, mechanisms in the cell stitch those together uh, automatically. So with this process, we just had to put uh, the four synthetic quarter mo molecules uh, into the yeast cell with something called a synthetic yeast centromere. When you look at pictures of chromosomes, you usually see this X or Y uh, kind of uh, structure. The dot at the center uh, is the centromere. Uh, and just making a small synthetic one for yeast allows us to actually grow bacterial chromosomes as though they were eukaryotic chromosomes. Putting these pieces together, yeast automatically assembled those, and that's what gave us uh, the uh, first uh, complete uh, synthetic chromosome um, back in 2008. This was the largest molecule of a chemically defined structure uh, ever uh, made. Now, we continued to uh, work on and improve the process of uh, DNA uh, synthesis and assembly. Dan Gibson, who started as a, a postdoc in the lab, uh, is now a full professor and heading the program and the team at Synthetic Genomics, took this laborious, time-consuming process uh, and greatly simplified it. He found that by combining the different enzymes in the small synthetic DNA fragments together in a single test tube at a single temperature at 50 degrees centigrade, that the pieces would automatically assemble together using these enzymes. Uh, when he got this working, and now some of you may even used it if you're taking part in any of these uh, iGEM contests, uh, it, we call it after uh, Dan, it's the, called the Gibson assembly method. And uh, when he worked this out, he came to me and 
Uh, Ham Smith, who's 82, he got the Nobel Prize in 1978. And our third partner is Clyde Hutchinson, who's in his uh, uh, late uh, 70s. Uh, and Dan said, I don't know what took you old guys so long. Um, so it always helps to have uh, new, uh, fresh eyes uh, looking at things. And the value of this technique, aside from simplifying everything, it allows it to be automated. So when you have a single step reaction that's just combining components, we can now go from the digital world to printing pieces of DNA uh, in an automated fashion. So how do you boot up a synthetic chromosome? Because it's, uh, uh, this was one of the biggest uh, challenges and we had a team working on this that finally solved it after a number of years uh, in 2007. And because this process is so important and that we found that when we change the genetic software in the cell, it converts one species into another. So let me walk you through it uh, because it is uh, critical to understanding your own biology as well as this new uh, set of processes. So we isolated a chromosome uh, from one bacterial cell uh, in mycoides. And when we first did this, we didn't know if there were going to be proteins required for genome transplantation. Uh, so we removed all the proteins from the DNA. We added some cassettes to the genome, uh, one so it would turn cells bright blue if the genome was activated, and another one for an antibiotic selection marker so we could select for cells uh, with that chromosome. It turns out you can't just pipette uh, large pieces of DNA without shearing them into smaller pieces. So we had to develop new techniques for moving things around in small gel blocks. We diffuse enzymes and uh, other gene fragments in and out of the gel blocks and add them to the chromosome. And just when we're trying to insert the genome for transplantation, uh, we just melt the gel block uh, and uh, either using uh, electric current or other methods, insert the DNA uh, into the recipient cells. M. capricolum was our recipient cell. Uh, it's about the same distance from M. mycoides that we are from uh, mice, uh, and the chromosomes are different sizes uh, and different structures, so it was easy to tell them apart. We have this uh, very sophisticated movie to show you what we think uh, happened. So we inserted the M. mycoides uh, chromosome into the capricolum cell. Now we have a cell, a body of a cell, a species, by all definitions until recently, uh, would be characterized as a Capricolum species, but it has two sets of genetic software. Uh, so what happened? Just like with the Phi X genome, when we put this uh, Mycoides genome into the cell, the DNA started to be read, started producing proteins. Some of the early proteins produced or the restriction enzymes that recognize DNA, and they recognize the Capricolum genome as foreign DNA and shoot it up. So now we have the body of one species and the genetic software of another. So what happened? In a very short while, we ended up with these bright blue cells, and when we interrogated them with a range of techniques, uh, there wasn't a single molecule left from the original Capricolum cell. All the proteins in the cell, all the molecules in the cell, either derive from the chromosome that we inserted into the cell or from uh, the metabolic activity of those proteins. So we think this was the first very clear-cut proof that life is a DNA software system. And when you change the software, you change the species. Now, the restriction enzymes are a very key part of this, uh, and we have different mechanisms uh, in our own bodies with enzymes that chew up DNA, because the concern would be every time uh, you ate a different uh, species, for example, if you had a fish a dinner last night, if you absorbed the fish DNA into your cells and couldn't get rid of it, you would start to transform yourself into a fish. This is what happens in the bacterial world. Sometimes entire chromosomes are consumed, and it adds over a thousand traits to the cell in a single evolutionary step. That's how we got plant cells. An entire bacterial uh, photosynthetic cell got absorbed into a eukaryotic cell, and that's how we got all the plants. 
The energy packs in our cells, the mitochondria, came from a, another eukaryotic cell absorbing uh, bacteria uh, that has a unique energy uh, metabolism. With our new techniques, we decided to make the 1.1 million base pair uh, mycoides genome, and we did this by making pieces that were 1,000 letters long. We put 10 of those together to make pieces that were 10,000 letters long, and we put 10 of those together to make pieces that were 100,000 letters long. We put 11 of those uh, into yeast, and yeast assembled uh, the genome. Uh, and we were able uh, to then uh, isolate uh, the genome from yeast, transplant it in the mycoides cells, and for the first time we ended up with these uh, blue cells that this time when interrogated uh, had only the synthetic chromosome in it, and everything in that cell was derived uh, from uh, that chromosome. This was reported in Science uh, in 2010. One way that we knew that it was in fact a synthetic DNA, aside from the differences in the chromosomes, is we developed a, a new approach for writing the entire English language with numbers and punctuation in the genetic code using just the four-letter code. Now, people have done this before with the ASCII code, but biology actually translates this information, and so we developed a code that puts in very frequent stop codons uh, because you wouldn't want to put in uh, your name and have that turned into a new bacterial toxin. So using this new code, uh, we uh, encoded a number of things in the genome. Uh, being the first species to derive uh, from a computer, uh, we put a URL into the genome, uh, and you were instructed if you decoded this to send an email uh, to the species saying you were able to read these watermarks. In addition, we added three quotations uh, from literature that I'd selected, to live, to err, to fall, to triumph, to recreate life out of life. That seemed highly appropriate. The second was from American Prometheus, uh, Oppenheimer's biography, see things not as they are, but as they might be, something he heard uh, from a teacher uh, early on in high school. The third was from Richard Feynman, what I cannot build, I cannot understand. When it became widely public uh, that these uh, watermarks and quotations uh, were in there, uh, we had lots of different responses. The first response uh, we got uh, for the James Joyce quote uh, was from uh, James Joyce, a state attorney, uh, <laughs> asking if we had permission to use his quotation. Uh, under U.S. Uh, copyright law, you can use up to a paragraph uh, uh, with proper citation, so we uh, dismissed that. And then we started getting emails from a Caltech scientist saying we had misquoted Richard Feynman. I'm sure you all know the dangers of relying what you find on Google as being gospel, uh, and I'm sure you've been chastised from your teachers about that. Well, I made that mistake. We took what we found on the Internet uh, and we used that. Uh, and to prove his point, he sent a picture of uh, Feynman's blackboard from the Caltech archives uh, with the correct quotation. It was actually one of Feynman's biographers, uh, biographers who changed this quotation. The original is, what I cannot create, I do not understand, which we think is a far better quotation. So we've gone back and changed the genetic code uh, so that Feynman uh, will rest uh, peacefully. So what have we done since then? Uh, we're trying to design a new species from scratch in the computer. And this is a huge challenge because in every cell, in every genome, 10 to 40% of the genes are of unknown function. Uh, my uncle is a, was a major designer at Boeing. He uh, helped design the 767. And I said, imagine designing the 767 without knowing what 10% of the parts did. He said, well, that's kind of how it happened. Uh, so, so apparently biology is not all that different from engineering. Um, but uh, we've been working on doing this and also using another computer term. We're trying to defrag the genome. Four billion years of evolution have made things kind of scrambled. If we're going to build things on a design basis going forward, uh, we want to have cassettes associated with uh, energy metal metabolism, with replication, et cetera. So we've been reorganizing the genome, uh, and we're trying to eliminate all genes 
uh, that aren't critical to be the minimal operating system on a cell. Uh, we have not achieved in uh, booting this up yet. Uh, we're very close, uh, and it's hard because it's iterative experimentation because of the unknown genes. So we have about 10% of the genes in our final genome are of unknown function. All we know is if they're not in the genome, uh, the cell uh, will not live. So we're now at this era where we can interconvert the biological and digital information. And so one implication of that is to be able to send biology as a digital magnetic wave. And we've been working with NASA on a sending unit. Think of having a robotic uh, a DNA uh, sequencer on Mars. And that's what we tested out in the Mojave Desert at the, the NASA test site where we uh, took uh, samples, uh, it kind of looks like uh, uh, Mars from the photos. Uh, our robot uh, wore a blue glove, um, and uh, we picked uh, samples, uh, so obviously that process needs uh, to be improved, uh, and sequenced them on the site, uh, and sent the data up to the cloud. And instead of having just a few uh, species, it was a wider range of eukaryotes and prokaryotes, but it went up to the cloud and then could be downloaded at the institute and be converted back into real biology. So we've been working with DARPA to build a digital biological converter that can take digital information or electromagnetic wave and convert it back into biology. And we have the first prototypes of this device uh, that have been tested. Uh, we send it digital information that can produce DNA, RNA, proteins, uh, small viruses, uh, and now living cells. And the first version of this uh, will be available uh, later this year. So this is an exciting time in science. We can interchange this information. We can actually send vaccines through the internet uh, and download them. And I think the future of this uh, entire area uh, will be coming up with the new applications, the new ideas of what biology would you want to download from the internet? What would you want to send? We're working on things like antimicrobials and vaccines, uh, but we're, we're trying to uh, uh, get ideas uh, from people uh, starting from a different point of view in life, uh, such as uh, this group here. If you could download anything from the internet of biological origin where it would be functioning, uh, what would you choose? Thank you very much.